all of you, uh, those present in the room, uh, those, uh, I guess there's an overflow room, maybe there's some people down there, and those who are joining us uh, by streaming, uh, for what really promises to be a lively and thoughtful conversation about the entanglements of Catholicism and the American Catholic Church. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge that the discussion is enabled by the generosity of John Deitchman of the class of 1970 and his family, uh, who endowed the Deitchman family lectures on religion uh, and modernity, under which we're sponsored today. And I'm grateful to my colleagues, uh, Matt Egemeyer and Peter Fritz, for their help in arranging this event, and to our friends at Commonweal Magazine, uh, uh, our media sponsors. Uh, we welcome Commonweal readers who are watching us online, live stream, uh, and invite our in-person audience uh, in Ream Library to pick up a complimentary copy of Commonweal in the back. I'll just say Ross brought no free New York Times, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> take that as you will. So uh, This is an event conceived before his arrival, but uh, wonderfully augmented by the, president, the presence of the 33rd president of the College of the Holy Cross. So Vincent de Rougeau will lead the conversation with our guests, Ross Douthat and Matthew Sitman. I'm grateful to Vince for joining us and uh, for the attention and energy that he's brought to these questions uh, that we'll discuss today. Vince Rougeau is a nationally respected expert in legal education and Catholic social thought and the author of Christians in the American Empire, Faith and Citizenship in the New World Order, which Oxford University Press published in 2008. In July, he became the 33rd president of the college, uh, its first lay president, and its first black president. And previously, he was dean of the Boston College School of Law for a decade, and the inaugural director of the Boston College Forum for Racial Justice in America. Uh, he's currently the president of the American Association of Law Schools. His research and writing is focused on the relationship between religious identity and citizenship in highly mobile and increasingly multicultural democratic societies. He served as senior fellow at the Center for Theology and Community in London, researching broad-based community organizing, immigration, and citizenship in the UK as part of the Just Communities Project. Ross Douthat, to my left, but on the right, we we're trying to figure out where we should actually fit the two conversants, left and right, uh, is a columnist for the New York Times, where his opinion pieces on politics, religion, and moral values in higher education appear each Tuesday and Sunday. He's the author of books including To Change the Church, Pope Francis and the Future of Catholicism, published in 2018, Bad Religion, How We Became a Nation of Heretics in 2012, The Decadent Society in 2020, uh, and with uh, Ryan Solomon, Solom, uh, Grand New Party, How Republicans Can Win the Working Class and Save the American Dream in 2008. Just a few weeks ago, he... <laughs> Study of decline. <laughs> <laughs> How'd that work out? As we for, it happened as we first saw, with some slight, <laughs> slight differences. We're already off and running. <laughs> a few weeks ago, he released a new book to widespread acclaim, The Deep Places, A Memoir of Illness and Discovery, about his uh, struggle with chronic Lyme disease. And if you haven't seen the book, you can get little shadows of that in, the, uh, uh, in his columns recently. But I know he'll want you to buy the book, too, instead of just reading the columns. So. Uh, Ross is a film critic for the National Review and a former senior editor at The Atlantic. Matthew Sitman is associate editor of Commonweal Magazine, the leading lay Catholic voice for commentary on religious, religion, politics, and culture, where he's taken positions on issues as div divisive as the Texas abortion law, voting rights, and COVID regulations. He's also a regular contributor to Dissent and co-host of Know Your Enemy, a podcast dedicated to exploring the modern American conservative movement. Our core question today uh, flips the script a little bit on some of the church and politics discussions that dominate our conversations and imaginations. There are legitimate questions to be raised about the role of religious actors on the democratic process, but there are, to my mind, equally important questions about what our particular political divisions and preoccupations have done to uh, the church, to the Catholic church. We could expand that to other churches, but we're staying with the Catholic church today. So I'm delighted that uh, Vince, Ross, and Matthew will be discussing the topic and really look forward to a lively discussion. Uh, Matthew will, will start our conversation and then uh, Ross will follow up, speaking for about 10 minutes each, after which Vince will engage them in discussion and eventually uh, open to questions. Uh, because we're being live streamed, uh, we will only take questions via the microphone 
and uh, Shiva, one of our students, will bring the mic around to people. Vince can call on people, but we'll ask you to, uh, to only do that, and we'll leave it to Vince to choose the uh, questions. So uh, welcome, Ross. Welcome, Matthew. Am I up? You're up. I'm going to go ahead and walk it over. <clears throat> well, thank you for having me again. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, President Rucho. Thank you for everyone who made the visit possible. This is my first trip to Holy Cross. Uh, so it's, um, I haven't been here that many hours, but I got a wonderful tour, and it's been really great to be here with you. This is the first event I've done post-pandemic. Um, not post-pandemic, but at this, uh, since before the pandemic. Uh, and the one, I did, the one I did before the pandemic was with you, Ross, I think, down at Georgetown. So um, here we are again. No Ross is one of my favorite enemies, you might say, um, uh, which we've done that joke too many times now, I think. But uh, <clears throat> I am happy to be here, and thank you again. Uh, what has American politics done to the Catholic Church, uh, which I take to mean what has American politics done to the Catholic Church in America? Um, I don't know, there's a lot of undergraduates here, so this joke might not land, but I was thinking of saying something like, let's all turn our gaze toward Baltimore, <laughs> where the bishops are meeting. See, no one got it. <laughs> uh, where the bishops are meeting. That's one indication of what's happening in the Catholic Church uh, in America. Um, but, uh, you know, I think another, joking aside, I think a common way to think about what our, what our politics has done to our church is by kind of lamenting that polarization has driven too many Catholics to pick and choose. That because neither one of the two major parties um, embodies the fullness of Catholic teaching, the tug of partisan loyalties inevitably means that your politics end up influencing your faith more than your faith influences your politics. And there's certainly a truth to that. Um, but it's also a kind of view that's always graded on me a little bit. For, for one thing, it's kind of a list style way of reasoning about this issue. Like you have immigration and abortion and taxes and healthcare on this side, and you know you can go down and you can say, well, this party is good on these these, these issues, that party is good on the other issues, um, and it's really a kind of both sidesism that I don't think really gets us much analytically, and it's almost a form of um, it's kind of strangely removed from other sorts of issues like the ongoing radicalization of the Republican Party against uh, majoritarian multiracial democracy, for example. So um, I want to propose something different, um, a different kind of angle into this. And the way I want to do that is by, when I was preparing for this event, I was thinking, you know, the United States is not a very merciful place. Um, so if I were to say what our politics has done to the Catholic Church here, I would say it's made it not a very merciful church. And, um, I think this probably gets some way toward uh, understanding why Pope Francis has met such a chilly sort of uh, reception among so many Catholics in the United States. He's made mercy the theme of his papacy. And mercy kind of uh, offend, has something to offend everyone, you might say. Against a stringent conservatism, dwelling on mercy feels like antinomianism or a kind of breakdown of rules and order in favor of freewheeling forgiveness, a weakening of morals, and a soft peddling of ethical demands. But I also think, you know, speaking kind of to my own commonweal Catholic tradition here, or parts of it, um, an emphasis on mercy can seem too uh, existential for a certain kind of religious liberalism. Um, it's too focused on the darker currents of our lives, the wounds we suffer from, which need to be healed. Um, the, the, uh, so it's neither, you know, not, and it's neither optimistic nor ideologically progressive. It's costly love in the midst of pain and grief, not false cheer. So that's, um, again, the main argument I want to make is that uh, one way of understanding what American politics has done to the Catholic Church in America is a focus on mercy. And I, I would just want to say a little bit more about this before, before I stop. I mean, Francis, there's a lot I could say about Francis and mercy. Um, I've found a number of Francis's documents, Laudato Si, Fratelli Tutti, um, the, the recent encyclical, really beautiful meditations on mercy. The section in Fratelli Tutti on uh, the, the parable of the Good Samaritan, where Francis specifically invokes mercy, and that kind of being a model for our political engagement to not walk by the people 
on the side of the road, those on the suffering on the side of the road, to, to give of our time, to give of our attention, to give of our energy. Um, he's talked about that a lot, and there's a lot I could say about it. Maybe we can get into that later. Um, but I want to just close by kind of offering one, this is, this is something I've talked about before, I've written about, but something I think that follows from the emphasis on mercy. And that is that you know, behind any politics is a certain view of the world, what you take to be fundamentally at work in this veil of tears. And you know, uh, how do you answer that question? Like, what are the fundamental things? How do you think of human beings? Like, who are we as creatures? Uh, what, is, like, what is it that we, as we go through our lives, you know, are you optimistic about uh, who we are and what we can achieve? Do you find our lives marked by suffering and struggling? Maybe it's both, it's a mix. But I wanna say that uh, by focusing on mercy in politics, um, I think it, it gets at uh, something I believe, which is that one way that we're united is how easily we can ruin our lives or have our lives ruined and how quickly everything we love can be taken away or have taken away from us. Um, you know, this is a politics based in human frailty. The understanding that we're less free than we want to admit. It points out the illusions of meritocracy, which mostly just flatter those who have been more fortunate or had the resources to evade consequences for their mistakes. Um, we're vulnerable to cruelty and chance, unexpected ruin or sudden defeat. And I think in the United States, uh, sadly, if I were to conclude here, it's my view is that you know the Catholic Church is not very has not become as merciful as it uh, should be, and in general our politics are suffering from a lack of mercy. The way you know we means test everything, the way we um, you know God helps those who help themselves. That's not in the Bible. <laughs> uh, so um, I'm here to uh, I guess bring a message of mercy. What has politics done to our church in this country? I would say it's made it less merciful. That's partly why we don't understand Francis. And I think it's why in this country, we still, one reason why, um, you know, it's, it's a pretty cruel and uh, unjust and unequal place. And uh, we need more mercy. Um. I want to uh, echo Matt's <laughs> thanks to everyone for being here, to Holy Cross for hosting us. This is my second visit to Holy Cross. I was last here when I was 20 years old uh, visiting a friend, and my main memory is perhaps drinking slightly too much and going <laughs> sledding down some of your excellent hills. Um, <laughs> so I hope that after dinner tonight we can without snow, admittedly, <laughs> recreate part of the, what I remember at least, as the Holy Cross experience. Um, so I, I sort of prodded Matt into going first, uh, partially because I was worried that we would agree too much in our diagnosis and that we wouldn't really get into sharp disagreement until we got into the nitty gritty of, you know, who stabbed who in the back first and these <laughs> kind of things. Um, and, but fortunately, I think, I think there's enough disagreement, even, even at the start, to just sort of prod on a couple of places. Because um, I'm going to defend for a minute that sort of conventional wisdom view of what's, of what's happened to American Catholicism and try and, you know, tr try and reframe it a little bit away from the sort of laundry list cliches of the Democrats are, have Catholic health care policies and the Republicans have Catholic abortion policies. And try and lift it up a little bit to the level of philosophy, maybe political philosophy, maybe not successfully, but, but we'll see. Um, but basically, I think you can tell a pretty compelling story where if you, you take American Catholicism as it was in the Vatican II era, and in that moment, it looks like the American church looks like one of America's strongest religious cultures in the sense of numbers, growth, cohesion, internal dynamism and interest, you know, you have a kind of Catholic literary renaissance, you have a lot of the most interesting intellectual debates sort of bubbling and percolating in Catholic journals like Commonweal uh, in the 1950s and early 1960s. And 
out of that sort of period, the church enters into the social revolutions of the 60s and 70s and enters into a kind of an internal civil war. So you have a strong culture, a strong religious culture that then divides against itself. And it divides against itself for good reasons. The, the, I'm, I'm not here to argue that, you know, the sort of culture war conflicts that have divided the church internally ever since the 60s are unimportant and we should just sort of step back from them and, you know, sort of find a higher, a higher synthesis. I think ultimately the church needs to find a higher synthesis, but it keeps coming back to questions about the liturgy, questions about sex and marriage and the role of women, all of these kind of neuralgic, <laughs> thorny issues, because they're actually important questions that actually were raised in profoundly new ways by the transformations of 50 or 60 years ago. But the upshot of having that kind of ongoing intra-Catholic debate, which has sort of created these camps of theologically conservative Catholics and theologically liberal Catholics, Pope John Paul II Catholics, and um, you know, Georgetown University Catholics, maybe to, to, to cite a different, a different Catholic school, and then Pope Francis Catholics and American Catholic critics of Pope Francis Catholics. Um, it's a kind of cumbersome title, but all, all these, these camps have been fighting over genuinely important issues in the life of the church, but they've done so in a way that has inevitably made the church as a whole a much weaker culture than it was 50 or 60 years ago, just in terms of instilling an identity that is a primary identity, so that people who are Catholic think of themselves as Catholics first and whatever else they are second. I think it was more the case in 1947 or 1957 that the typical American Catholic thought of Catholicism as their primary identity than is, than is the case today. And once that happens, then other stronger cultures, basically the political cultures created under conditions of polarization, what we think of as Fox News culture and MSNBC culture, um, you know, sort of populist culture and, you know, liberal culture, whatever, whatever terms you want to put on them, become stronger and basically steal energy and loyalty and attention and intensity from that, that should be in a better world going into the life of the church. Um, and you can frame that kind of political polarization in a couple of different ways. You could say basically that you know, American Catholics are the inhabitants of a deeply Protestant country and what we see in our political debates is a polarization between two very different Protestant factions. Basically, the old conflict between New England Puritans and Baptists, you know, sort of recreated between, you know, secular progressives who are the true heirs of New England Puritans and um, Trump, Trumpist Republicans who are sort of the true heirs of uh, low church, low church Protestants, and so. It's, it's natural and predictable that American Catholics would sort of be caught in the middle of that kind of conflict. You could frame it that way. Or you could say it's a sort of grim parody, and hopefully only a parody, of the far right and far left conflicts that define the first half of the 20th century in Europe. Um, so, you know, to, again, today's populism versus progressivism maps onto yesterday's fascism versus socialism and communism. And now, as then, Catholics sort of find themselves in a weaker position relative to those two stronger political forces and feel like they just have to choose sides as the church, or at least Catholic institutions and Catholic politicians ended up doing frequently and, let's say, not always successfully in the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Um, so those are, those are a couple of frameworks, I think, for thinking about what's, what's happened. Basically, that part of the story is just internal to the life of the church. You had a, a genuine cultural transformation that raised a host of new questions that created new internal debates that divided the church at the same time that stronger political identities were forming on right and left outside the church, which then pulled energy from 
this sort of internally divided Catholicism into political debates so that more and more people are just defined, even if they are baptized Catholics and practicing Catholics as Republicans first and Democrats second. I mean, sorry, as Republicans first and Catholics second, as Democrats first and Catholics second. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that story is broadly convincing and hopefully I've floated it in a way that is, you know, more interesting than just the view that says there's a list of issues on which one side is better than the other. It's more than just a list of issues. It's that you have these sort of philosophically coherent forces arrayed to the left of the church and to the right of the church, and almost by gravitation, if you have a weak gravitational center in Catholicism itself, Catholics are going to be pulled out from whatever attempt at a coherent Catholic culture we can imagine and towards these two stronger, more political forces. Um, and I guess to, to, to conclude, I think I, I agree with Matt to a certain extent in the, the view that, you know, um, American life generally by its nature, it's, you know, it's always been a more sort of libertarian, small l libertarian culture um, in ways that you know, are connected to Protestantism and individualism and capitalism and many things that Catholics have always been suspicious of. And I think that that does create a certain kind of presumption against forms of solidarity and the mercy that's linked to solidarity um, that, yeah, that sort of create a kind of inherent alienation between American culture and what the Catholic Church at least aspires towards. I think, I think that's fundamentally right. And again, it means that because you have this sort of, you know, this sort of natural or very deep-rooted aspect of America, you need a strong Catholic culture to avoid being sort of conformed to Americanness. And I don't think we have that right now. Um, but just to end on a note of, of disagreement, I think you know, the signal, the signal opportunity of the Francis pontificate was to sort of speak to the Catholics and not only Catholics who are themselves alienated by this endless clash of right and left, you know, sort of elite progressivism versus populist conservatism and so on. Um, and I think that fundamentally the Holy Father has just been more successful at speaking to, if I may, Matt's side of that, of that divide than my own. And I think that there is a at least mild deficit of mercy, sympathy, and understanding when either the Holy Father or, you know, we'll say, we'll say the forces at work in the Vatican and Rome turn their gaze to the right. Uh, and I think slightly more mercy and understanding would have go, gone a longer way towards the kind of reforging of, of a culture that is Catholic first and politically partisan in one way or another second. So I'll leave it there and we can, we can mix it up. Thank you. Well, I want to offer my thanks to you both and I want to begin by saying I, I, I'm a little starstruck here. I read both of you all the time. And, uh, <laughs> so, um, I, and I feel that uh, your early comments are a reflection of the benefit of that reading for me at least. Um, so I thought I would uh, begin my questions to you all, to you both, uh, around the theme that you both sounded, and around a theme that's really important to us here at Holy Cross. And one thing that we have done, I think, very well here, and that we are very, um, you know, very conscious in reminding ourselves is that the Catholic Church is a global church. Uh, and you both drew out pieces that I think are worth exploring a little bit more deeply. Uh, we're talking about an American experience of Catholicism today. And we're talking about the experience of, of Catholicism in what is, as you said, Ross, a deeply Protestant country. Uh, and I'm wondering how we think about the ways we are responding to our own culture here in the United States as Catholics in the context of the reality of global Catholicism, because in a sense, um, there are some pretty distinctive features of American Catholicism <laughs> that you don't see elsewhere. And I, I'm gonna get into this a little bit more because I think we need to think more carefully about 
how people who come out of more distinctively Catholic cultures respond to similar phenomena, but we'll get there. But in the meantime, um, one thing you didn't raise is how immigration and assimilation in the American Catholic experience are also a product of how we might be responding to some of these issues. But I guess my foundational question for both of you is, we like to think of ourselves as fairly normative, that we are, are doing something that should be a model to the rest of the world, but what if we're really outliers as American Catholics? Oh, I wouldn't hold us up as models for anyone, <laughs> really. <laughs> I think we're, the church in America is in pretty rough shape, and, and I think it's, it actually, I think, to get some of what Ross was discussing, I mean, this is an open question for me, uh, actually. Um, you know, what, what, can, what can withstand the forces of American political polarization? Because we see even with things like vaccines, right, that thing, you know, things that maybe a few decades ago would, would not have been as controversial. There, everything goes through the mob, this, you know, everything, it, it, it's like two distinct epistemologies at work or something. Like, it doesn't seem like anything can escape the tentacles of our polarization. So I think the American church is kind of an outlier, and I think uh, one way to see that is the, uh, not uniformly, but um, the extent to which, say, you know, uh, the American Episcopate's relationship to Francis seems to be driven by culture war issues in a way that you don't, other um, you know, Episcopal conferences don't seem to be focused on those same things in the same way. So I agree with the, the premise of your question, and I'm, it just made me think about like, what, what could stand up to the forces in American life that are so polarizing? Because I'm, sure, I'm not sure it's within our, you know, our power, Catholic's power, the church's power. I don't know what it would look like to resist that. It seems like nothing can. Has anything really successfully resisted these trends in our life? Um, everything that seems to emerge gets you know, assimilated to, to those patterns, it seems like. And so I, I don't know how to... Um, you know, what exactly that says or, or how to get out of it. But I am struck, I think, by the distinctiveness of American Catholicism in a not totally complementary sense. Yeah, it's very distinctive. I think that one interesting question is, what is normative Catholicism, right? I, I mean, I, th I think you can, 60 or 70 years ago, you would have told the story where there is sort of the traditional Catholic cultures of Europe where Catholicism itself is normative. Um, and the conflicts are mostly between Catholicism and anti-clericalism in its various forms. And then you have America as this weird but increasingly important outlier um, that is a, a very strong seeming church operating within a very Protestant culture. And then you have the missions. But flash forward to today, and if you went continent by continent, I mean, so Catholicism in Europe is this sort of you know, in certain ways, exhausted seeming relative, relative to the US, whatever our, um, you know, endless sort of internal problems, if you just go by mass attendance and vocations and various things, the American church looks healthier than most of these, most of the European churches, especially in Western Europe. Um, so you have that dynamic, and that, that led, I think, a lot of American conservative Catholics, especially in the John Paul II era, to tell their own sort of triumphalist stories about, you know, sort of secular, secular liberalism has conquered Europe, and we in America have the true faith sort of preserved in this, you know, distinctively American setting. I wouldn't tell that kind of story right now, but I also would say, you know, the action in Catholicism around the world is very distinctive too. The dynamics in Latin America in certain ways look European in the sense, you know, these are traditionally Catholic cultures where the church has weakened and had scandals and been too connected to power in various ways. Um, but there you have this kind of rapid Protestantization, the rise of Pentecostalism and so on that doesn't really have an analog in Europe. And then you leap across the Atlantic to Sub-Saharan Africa and the dynamics are entirely different and you know, very different socioeconomic challenges, conflict with Islam, the role of sort of Western imperialism as, as a shadow over everything, and then you know, Asian Catholicism is incredibly diverse and disparate too. So I guess I'm not, I'm not offering, all, I'm, I'm offering a point that there is, there is no normative, I think. You can't, you can't say America is an outlier from 
global Catholicism. Global Catholicism is a group of things, of Catholicisms that are all outliers from one another in interesting ways. And the American situation is, you know, if you wanted to draw one loaded historical analogy, you'd say we're a lot like France in medieval Catholicism. We are the, again, we, we're sort of, our, our churches are dynamic in certain ways relative to their neighbors, but our country is the big aggressive, you know, superpower. Mm -hmm. And for those complicated reasons, we're always in conflict with Rome. Like, I feel like the relationship the relationship between Rome and America now is a lot like the relationship between Rome and Gallican Catholicism in various mm -hmm. forms. Um, and you know, there's sort of a liberal Catholic reading of this that says, yes, American conservative Catholics are just like the Jansenists in France <laughs> and, you know, in the 17th century. And eventually, we just need the encyclicals and papal bulls condemning them, condemning them completely um, and letting the Jesuits triumph, in which case then American conservatism will return as Jansenism did in the French Revolution and wreak a terrible, no, sorry. Um, <laughs> anyway, I, but that's, that's, that's the one, having sort of globetrotted a little in my answer, that's the, I think, historical analogy. It is quite common for Rome and the Vatican to have a very complicated relationship with the church as it is embodied in the most politically powerful country in the Catholic <laughs> orbit, which is for now what America is until China becomes a Catholic empire in 2172 AD. <laughs> well, I guess. Um, <laughs> Trying to give you a lot there <laughs> to riff on. I suppose I want to think a little bit more about the United States in this context than just to say um, are we then doomed uh, as Catholics in this country to just be sucked into these, uh, these debates internally that really are the product? of forces that are not necessarily products of the Catholic experience. Because I mean, I think you could look at Latin America and say there are parallels you could draw uh, between, you know, in terms of societies that, that have had heavy waves of immigration, yet the, the, the founding culture was a Catholic culture as opposed to a, a, a Protestant culture. You could look at places like Australia and Canada and say, too, that the church there is very different from what we see, and those countries are much more like us. Um, so there must be something distinctively American going on internally that's affecting our own receptivity and our own sort of understanding as Catholics in the United States of what our faith asks of us, what our, our commitments are as Catholics, because we don't seem in this country to have done very much lately to resist what you're talking about, right? I mean, is, and maybe we're not supposed to, but it strikes me that there could be a way of being Catholic in the United States that would set us up as a force apart or a, a culture apart um, in, in resistance to some of the trends you both mentioned in American culture that are, are very anti-Catholic in terms of our own cultural uh, predispositions as Catholics. Um, well, one thing, if I may, uh, I was thinking about when you were talking, Ross. I've been on a big Gary Wills kick lately, reading as many, as I know, Ross, typical, right? He's a great writer. Uh, he is, but um, I've been thinking about his phrase from Bear Ruin Choirs uh, called The Reign of the Two Johns, John, Pope John Paul the, or John the XXIII and uh, John F. Kennedy. And his portrait of mid-century Catholicism, like it had the strength you described, Ross, but it also seemed like an edifice ready to... I mean, Wills is biting critique of like the, the priest as um, country club slash CEO. Like there was the strength of that that period of the church was based in part on compromises with American culture. It just American culture hadn't moved quite as far yet right. as, as as it would. So I'm I'm you know I'm not sure. Sometimes we the periods of strength we look back to what that strength actually consisted in or um, how if what could have been done to prevent what happened afterwards, like take the Second Vatican Council. Um, would, you know, would that, did that accelerate trends? Did it actually help? We can't really know counterfactually what it would have been like to not have that council and have the church's engagement with modern life not include those documents, those deliberations, et cetera. So I'm, I'm not sure in that sense uh, how I, like I'm still thinking through like how the historical changes, what actually wrought them in a way and what, if anything, could have been done uh, to resist them. But I did uh, want to pick up on one thing, President Rougeau, you mentioned, which is that 
like one form of resistance, we, when we've, we've used the term strength, the strength of the church here. So, but um, you know, we do worship a savior whose power was made perfect in weakness. And I think there might be some kind of, whatever Catholic renewal looks like in the United States, it'll have to somehow you know, realize that the cross comes before the crown and tomorrow's a Monday morning, right? And you know, that's the way of weakness, it's the way of um, uh, you know, not clutching for cultural power and political power in a certain way. Maybe, I mean, I'm not a proponent of disengaging our, you know, our life together um, politics, but there does seem some kind of unhealthy, uh, both partisan polarization that we've been discussing, but just a lust for power, a sense that we, ha that, you know, the, the church has to be involved in a certain way or, or wield certain uh, power in the ways it can, whether through persuasion or otherwise. But that's something that I've been trying to think about is what would it like, as you're saying, for the Catholics here to stand back, stand apart, and try something else. And I think it, you know, it has a lot to do with power and what the Christian tradition actually teaches us about power. I think there's a big challenge, though, there, which is that you can, it, getting from a point of power and influence to a point of let's say, sort of holy weakness, is often a really destructive process that is sort of hard to, you can't just sort of fast forward, right, right. from like your Constantinian corruption to your, you know, your holiness in the catacombs. Yeah. In fact, to go from, from one place to another means what the universe that Northeastern Catholicism especially is right. going to probably live through over the next few decades of endless church closings and um, yeah. you know, uh -huh. sort of decline and a sort of, a, a kind of mix of dispiritedness and what I see happening a lot, not just in sort of partisan politics, but sort of in institutional battles within the church where the territory shrinks and people don't get holier, they fight more <laughs> over the territory yeah, that's shrinking. It's like if you're going from five parishes to three, we're going through this right now in New Haven, so it's very much on my mind, this kind of thing. Who actually has the best parish? You know, which order is in control of this or that? You know, who gets this who gets the body of the, you know, the, the blessed who might become a saint? Like these these things become occasions of sin, right? Um, and you know, the 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 corruptions that absolutely exist in a church that seems to be more at a flush tide do also create a sense that like there's enough for everybody, right? Like uh -huh. and which which can be a can be a good thing. It removes certain temptations yeah. at least. Scarcity does not bring out the best in human beings. Well not immediately, <laughs> right? Maybe on the far side of uh -huh. the transformation it does. I mean so my I mean my feeling tends to be that like if you are if you are if you are sort of an individual who has a vocation or desires to build an institution or start something new, then you should absolutely think as Matthew suggests and think like how can this new community or school or magazine or whatever that I'm starting exist outside of the culture war, outside of American polarization. I'm not sure that option is available to bishops or God help you college presidents <laughs> or you know figures who are by inherently invested because that's the thing, Catholicism in the U.S. is this weird, it's this weird creature that's too weak to exert itself powerfully, but too strong to sort of become, you know, become, to achieve the holiness that awaits outside of, at once, once that power has been shrugged off. Like, you have responsibilities. You run a college that's important in this city in Massachusetts. Your voice matters. You, you are connected to power, no matter what, and you have to figure out how to speak you know, maybe maybe not as prophetically as a bishop is expected to speak, ideally, but still with some, you're a spokesman for a Catholicism invested with some kind of worldly power. So there isn't, for people in that position, um, we can talk about whether newspaper columnists and magazine editors are in that position or not, but for people in that kind of position, I think there's, you, you still have to think about the uses of power because you still have it in whatever limited or attenuated form. Well, maybe there's a middle space here around something that <coughs> I do believe we all 
claim to be committed to as Americans and that we might all agree is a positive about our, our American experience from whatever faith tradition one comes. And that's a commitment to these core values of our liberal democratic project. I mean, are we going to participate as citizens in a democracy that you know, has certain understandings of our role uh, and about the equality of members of the, of the, of the society for purposes of, of our politics? And maybe in our role as Catholic citizens, there's something there that we should be offering to the conversation and to that project. If we indeed believe that as Americans, we should be committed to democracy at the core, because arguably there's not a whole lot more that unites us as Americans other than our commitment to this democratic project, because you know, beyond that, things get a little messy. So how might we, as American Catholics, demonstrate some understanding of our role as citizens, but bringing that faith tradition to the project in a way that ameliorates some of the negatives that you've discussed and also recognizes, Ross, on, to your point, of the fact that we are involved in institutions and projects that you know, connect us to power. And perhaps that's not the bad thing because I mean, we are members of the society and we have some obligation to participate. Do you want to go first this time, Ross? <laughs> <laughs> um, so yes, I think that's, I, I agree that that's, that that's certainly is a place to start. Um, and I think from um, you know, the perspective of the condition of the Republican Party to which Matt alluded is particularly important. You know, it, it, I, I think it would have been good to have Catholic bishops more front and center in certain ways, sort of in and around the events of January 6th sort of offering sharp critiques of where part of the Republican Party ended up. Um, I don't think that would be a bad thing. Um, but that is itself a partisan intervention, right? Like, there's, there's no sort of, I mean, that's part of what conditions of polarization do, right? There's no, there's no sort of, you know, you, you, you make the intervention, or, or you can make a more general intervention, but someone is always going to ask the next question, right, which is, well, what does the church think about, um, you know, the voting voting regulations just passed in Georgia, right? Like a general commitment to democratic citizenship does not. There, yeah, there's always a follow up question. I guess is what I'm suggesting. And in that sense, I mean, I I feel like there are ways in which one. I think there are just real limits to what. The, the sort of bureaucratic bodies that we've ended up since you brought up the you know the Baltimore meeting like I don't think I don't think you know the the sort of national agglomerations of Catholic bishops um, can really speak together I mean they, they they really do just sort of recapitulate the divisions of Congress <laughs> right or something like I was looking on Twitter as I came in, and we just had a, a 121 to 120 vote for some <laughs> one of these bishops' offices. I mean, right? There's, there's no, you know, there's that that aspect of, of the bishop's life seems just sort of captured by its own kind of partisanship. But an individual bishop, which is in fact the traditional locus of authority in the church, um, you know, should be able to speak publicly in a frank way on a diversity of, of, of topics. And there are bishops who do that, but in general, you listen to them and you're like, all right, this bishop is gonna be sharp on this issue and blunt on, on and you know, he's gonna generalize on that issue and be specific on, on that issue. Um, and I, I think we could use more bishops who, you know, who, who take, who, who take that sort of checklist of different issues and take a harder line in criticizing, criticizing both, both political parties. I, in that sense, I don't know if it's sort of a general commitment that gets you to a more authentic Catholic role. It's more sort of making it clear that you're not just a Democrat or just a Republican by really, attack, you know, really attacking both sides. I think it would be, if you took the most, I won't mention any names, but if you took the most barbed critiques of Republicans 
from liberal-leaning bishops and the most barbed critiques of Democrats from conservative-leaning bishops and had one bishop who was issuing them all, you know, that, that, might, that might be kind of good, kind of good for the church. Maybe not. Maybe it would be a disaster and his diocese, his fundraising would dry up. And yeah, I mean, you know, they're yeah. to the burdens of leadership. Yeah. But um, yeah. Well, I mean, the, the, the question of democracy that you raise is, is that kind of one minimal commitment. I think as Ross said, and as I mentioned earlier, it, you can see just the way it would immediately get sucked into the, the polarized partisan vortex, right? If, if on January 7th, um, I actually don't know when uh, Archbishop Gomez gave his first you know, um, comments about what happened on January 6th, so I'm speaking hypothetically. But you know, uh, if, if you'd come out and gave a, um, you know, uh, said something that upset Republicans, Ross, what you said would happen would have happened, right? Like he would have been dismissed as you know, just someone else who drunk the Kool-Aid, someone who felt like he had to toe a certain line in the media, so on and so forth. Like you could, you know exactly. Currying how favor go. with the New York Times. Right. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> but when you're looking at something as obvious as January sixth, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. where people are storming the Capitol, I think you know we all can probably agree that that happened. We saw it. Um, and uh, I we're mean, getting very close to. Yeah, uh, I know. But we. I mean, <laughs> Tucker Carlson's something, upcoming something, special. Might something happened. I saw people enter the Capitol. I saw people going into the Capitol through a, an entrance having grown up going to the Capitol most of my life because my father worked at the Senate mm -hmm. and then in um, the administration, the Carter administration, so I was there all the time. Mm -hmm. I knew that they were, there were people in places that people were not allowed to be. Um, so, I mean, that was obvious to me as a person who grew up in Washington, D.C. and its environs. Um, but p putting that to the side for a second, you know, there were, and violence took place, right? There were clearly acts of violence that took place. And it's, it's interesting to me that we're saying, well, you know, it's kind of difficult for a bishop to speak about an act, acts of violence that we all witnessed on film that we know happened, one. And let me put that into historical context. So when my parents were growing up in Louisiana in the 1950s, bishops specifically spoke to issues like segregation and to excommunicated people over issues I mean, with the same kinds of responses. You know, you're a left-leaning liberal, you're not from here, but they did it. They excommunicated people who opposed the desegregation of the Catholic schools. Uh, they spoke to it from the pulpit. Um, so it strikes me odd that we would apologize or even, you know, <clears throat> be, be hesitant to ask our bishops to you know, speak as men of God, men of faith, as pastors in these moments where certainly bad things happened, right? I mean, something bad happened. Um, and you know, the church has a view. Because if they're not taking a stand, then what does that say to us in the pews? Should we? Right, but the dilemma is that, I mean, first, Matt, like, even, even within I take a pretty dim view of what happened on January 6th. But if you sat Matt and I down and we talked for 30 minutes about what happened, by the end we would probably be arguing with each other, right? Because, probably. Because, you know, it would be like, well, is this, a, is this a coup and an insurrection or is it a, you know, a sort of, uh, sort of infantile riot? Like that's just right there. There's a, pretty, there's a pretty big gap, right? So the language that the bishops use, even where there's agreement and there was more agreement right after January 6th than there is now. Um, even that is challenging, um, which is, again, it's not a reason not to do it, but it's a, reason, it's a reason to recognize the political landscape in which you are operating, right? And so in, you know, in Louisiana, the, the, what the bishops did was, you know, the excommunications were not issued for support of segregation, they were issued for disobedience right, to the archbishop's order to desegregate schools. So that, that's, that's true, but you could have, I mean, in this climate, you could say that, well, that was a political act, right? Yes. So oh, no, it was absolutely a political act, but it was a political act that was sort of calibrated in a particular way to the authority that the bishops had over schools. Um, it was more, I guess all I'm saying is that it was less perfectly idealistic and more, you know, faintly Machiavellian in its own way, right? And that's, I mean, that's the, the, the challenge is that, 
the church in trying to then act realistically then has to reckon with the, pre the pre-existing partisanship that it's already dealing with, right? Which you see, you see this happening to, to flip the partisan script to territory more favorable <laughs> side <laughs> side than January 6th in the question of, of Joe Biden and communion and abortion, right? Where, you know, the Catholic Church obviously has a view on abortion. We have a Catholic president who represents a political party that the Catholic bishops have been remonstrating with for 50 years. And during that period, the Democratic Party has become generally, some exceptions, generally more pro-abortion, not less so. So you have this sort of strategy of engagement that is the strategy that, for instance, the editors of Commonweal would urge on the bishops, a strategy of you know, not, using the, not using Holy Communion as a weapon and so on. That strategy has not worked. Maybe it's going to start working tomorrow, but it hasn't worked over 50 years. It has not produced any substantial change towards the Catholic position in the Democratic Party. Now, does that mean that the other strategy, the strategy preferred by like Bishop Paprocki or someone would work? No, probably not, <laughs> right? Like, but it be precisely because it would be seen that, that you know, d if, if 20 Catholic bishops all agreed that including Biden's own bishops that they were gonna deny him communion, it would be perceived as a partisan act in a way that would undercut its significance. But, but it's not as if there exists it's not as if the current strategy has succeeded in its aims, right? And again, these are the dilemmas of having this kind of public voice and public office, but also being too weak to sort of exercise real authority. And I don't know, as you can tell from my rambling answers, I don't <laughs> know how the bishops find their way out of that dilemma. Um, yeah. Well, maybe then, maybe we can shift a little bit from the hierarchy of the bishops and maybe elite opinion yeah. and to ask then, I mean, we, and we've seen this historically, sometimes there are conversations happening at those levels, mm -hmm. uh, arguments, dis debates, that the faithful, the people in the pews, just ignore and they go on and, and live their faith more authentically, uh, you know, through other, other types of engagements. And so is that, because I'm sensing in this conversation that we feel fairly there's not a whole lot of hope in, in our understanding of how we get out of this dilemma around the American political uh, polarization and cultural polarization, uh, at least certainly in, in the corridors of power, the bishops, the Congress, wherever. But there's a whole, there are a whole lot of other people, uh, and the church has some, some interesting history around authentic popular movements, authentic rising from below. So maybe we could focus a little bit on that. What should we be doing in the pews, or in the communities, in our organizations? Well, you know, one thing that I, um, just to, to um, kind of agree with you about the somewhat elite nature of the conversation so far, I think that's part of the confusion for me, right? I read the news all the time. I work for a Catholic magazine. I live in New York City. I am not, you know, familiar with the struggles of a parent trying to raise a kid and keep them in the faith, you know, um, in some other part of the country I've never been, right? So I, I hope there's a certain humility that is, you know, the kind of cousin of uh, our lack of hope here <laughs> or, or something. Um, but I would say, you know, one of the beautiful things about um, living in New York is that um, I can go to parishes that are really like, wonderfully diverse and you see, uh, you know, just, uh, all kinds of human beings there, um, uh, and it's and when I and but there are times. This will sound really corny, but um, after uh, the 2016 election, I was at mass, and there was this just. Uh, and I was at Blessed Sacrament on 71st and Broadway on kind of Upper West Side, and it was you know there was someone in a wheelchair, and there was um, you know various races. Um, it was an LGBTQ friendly parish too, so. It was this really like wonderful kind of mix of humanity. I think uh, Ross and I were talking about. He asked me where I've been going to mass, and I like being in an actual parish, even though I live like two blocks from St. Patrick's. Because when you go to an actual parish, and the people who are there are there, you, it's it's this wonderfully eclectic and somewhat random mix of people f who congregate there, and I feel like that's probably churches where that happens, where you are not sorted by ideology where you show up because it's kind of your neighborhood 
and that's where you like to, and, and you know, you, you, other people from your neighborhood are there. That's like a fairly rare space in American life where I think you can, people you are in relationship with, you have the capacity, the relationships that aren't defined just by politics. Maybe from the bottom up, slowly but surely, like, you know, not to sound too um, schmaltzy or something, but, you know, conversations that, that you can't have in the pages of a magazine even, right? Or debates you can't really have in the pages of a magazine. The conversations you can have with people you know and love and live with and you know, go to the same parish with. Um, if, that's a, if that's a not a self-sorted group, you really have the opportunity to maybe work out some of this, figure out something beyond the current polar, polarization and divides. I don't know. That's kind of the closest you know, the work we actually do in our day-to-day -day lives with our family and friends and our parishes and the people around us we know and love, that's like the one thing we can control to some degree. And, you know, modeling different ways of being Catholic in those contexts is um, maybe one of the, the only things I can come up with. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would endorse everything that you just said, basically. I mean, I, I think that the, I think there, yeah, there are definitely ways in which the even the the residual hierarchical nature of the parish structure in American Catholicism is oddly or maybe not oddly sort of a an impediment to sort of total polarization, right? Uh -huh. Like as long as most Catholics are going to a church that's somewhere near them, obviously parish right. lines have broken down in various ways, but going to a church that's somewhere near them they are likely to experience something that is more complex and diverse in their <laughs> parish community than are, you know, certain forms of sort of fully self-selected, um, you know, I, I don't want to use Protestant as, <laughs> as a critical term, but, but you know, there's, there's a greater self-selection, a greater <laughs> congregational, yeah, I mean, some of my best friends are congregationalists, but yeah, the, the sort of self, the, the inherent, the sort of, seeker-sensitive, consumerist model of church shopping that is so common to America generally. And that is, you know, also part of some of, part of the resilience of American religion, right? I mean, that is the, the complexity here, right? Which is that in European contexts where you only have sort of the remains of that Catholic structure, you have less religious vitality in certain ways than in America. But in terms of a form of religion that is, that is outside the lines of polarization, I think I, I agree. I think that structure provides something. I mean, I also think that there is, there is, you know, the the strongest, the culturally the strongest parts of American Catholicism map onto the culturally strongest parts of American life generally. Like Catholicism does exhibit many of the same features of the wider society, where the the parishes that look the most solid tend to be well-educated, affluent. Catholics and the places the and with with the exception of immigrant communities and that is a big exception I know but with that big exception the parts of American Catholicism in the worst shape are what used to be these sort of working class strongholds of the faith and so one of the big challenges especially for those of us operating in these kind of pseudo elite worlds is how do you carry some of that um, you know sort of upper middle class Catholicism out of the, you know, college educated <laughs> parish to the rest of American society. And that, again, I think is a microcosm of a larger challenge that the whole country faces. So like, you know, the upper, the, the mass upper class has done very well and the mass working class has not over the last 40 years. Mm -hmm. And part of that reflects just this sort of separation, geographical separation of those classes. But you could argue that Catholicism as a religion with this strong tradition of missionary orders, intentional communities, all of these kind of things, is better equipped than sort of secular forces to actually bridge that divide. And I mean, to be frank, sort of send people out of the affluent cities <laughs> into the rest, into the rest of the country, and into yeah the network of parishes that exists beyond New Haven and Brooklyn. Well, actually, I live in Manhattan, oh, Ross. <laughs> sorry, I, I'm sorry, I'm right, you're in Manhattan. Manhattan. I apologize. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean to be really offensive. <laughs> <laughs> he was, he was living in Brooklyn. Well, 
Well, actually, I want to dive into your exception because I've, I, th there's something that I think is really important for us to discuss. I mean, my experience of some of my most authentic worship experiences have been when I have taken myself out of the upper middle class experience of a suburban parish and gone into ethnic and immigrant parishes. Now, for instance, um, I've been to Tucson, Arizona several times and gone to the Mariachi Mass at the cathedral, which is full and it has families, multi-generational families, you know, worshiping together and, you know, and tourists and affluent people from the suburbs all coming into the center of the city to worship at the cathedral in this very authentic, very culturally meaningful experience that reflects not only Mexico but also Arizona's culture as a border space. Um, and people are drawn to that and feel in, invigorated by it. Um, and here in Worcester, the parishes that are flourishing are, and I get this, I got this directly from the bishop, Vietnamese parishes, you know, the Dominican parishes. And frankly, what I, I want, this kind of brings us back to where we started. Our inability at times in this country to see this faith as global and to engage those spaces in our own country that bring it to us, I think is a failing of the elites in this country. And in a sense, we have not understood our obligation to learn from and engage and be in more meaningful community with people that are often on the margins of our society, but who are actually bringing to us a full and authentic and fresh exp expression of faith that could allow us at the ground level to create something very new. So if we could rethink, for instance, how we understand parish, how we understand worship, and engage some of those communities where there is real energy. Yes, some of it is drifting off into evangelicalism and Pentecostalism, partially because it's marginalized. But if it were engaged, could that be a way forward? This is a multicultural society, a place of immigration and migration. It's a settler nation. It is not, we don't have you know, an authentic American culture that is you know, here, has always been here, other than the native cultures. So we as Catholics have the structure to kind of bring that together, but we aren't doing that because we are living in our geographic and socioeconomic hideaways. Is there something there? Yeah, I mean, some of the most, um, I'm gonna plug common wheel here. <laughs> um, the, uh, in the spring of the, uh, shortly after the pandemic started, um, that would have been 2020, since time's right. We did a sh uh, uh, issue called the Parish Issue on Parish Life Today. And I mean, there's, a number, your description was, was right, and um, you know, these are places of vitality, mixed parishes, but there's a lot to sort through. The number of uh, priests in the United States who can speak Spanish is shockingly low. I mean, not even close to you know, parity with the number of Spanish-speaking Catholics. Um, and what we do with parishes that maybe have different communities in them, uh, right? Um, Masses in different light. How do you do shared you know, uh, parish spaces? Those issues are, are real, right? How do you equip priests and clergy? How do you deal with this at a parish level? All those questions are real, but I, I, not to get us back to something pessimistic, but we do kind of know that like, um, influxes of, of uh, immigrants into the church isn't like a forever fix. And as people assimilate to American life, the very polarization we're you know, describing becomes more and more present, right? As people climb up the economic ladder and you know, gain some semblance of middle class life, however you want to put it, that is, you know, th that's, th that'll mean, you know, it seems like the forces in America just, that are um, driving all this, it, you, you know, immigrant parishes, immigrants, is, they're not gonna escape it finally, probably. Well, right? and, to, and, <laughs> and in, or if they are going to escape it, it's not, we're not going to come up with some plan. <laughs> right, to, right, right. To, I mean, yeah, I mean, look, in, in, I was, you know, whining about the state of Catholicism in my own city. And of course, the reality is that while, you know, the Archdiocese of Hartford is having all of its conversations about how to, you know, reconsolidate its dying parishes, it sort of assumed that, well, you know, but the one Hispanic parish is booming, right? Like, I mean, that is sort of taken for granted that, yes, and then you have the immigrant church over here doing its thing and, you know, all the masses mm -hmm. are full. Um, and there has to be something absolutely that um, sort of mostly white, um, Irish, Irish, Italian, uh, Anglo, 
Catholicism can take um, or draw or learn from these experiences. Sure. But the long-term question that you're gesturing at, Matt, is basically, you know, do these communities follow the trajectory of assimilation where you either assimilate upward toward sort of polarized bourgeois secularism or assimilate to, you know, the lapsed Catholicism of the post-industrial Midwest? Like, if those are your paths, and there's good, ideally there would be another path for those <laughs> Vietnamese Catholics and those Mexican Catholics and so on, but they're the ones who are going to find it right mm -hmm. in the end, not, yeah, not sort of editors and columnists. Um, yeah, so that's, I mean, in a sense, we're just sort of watching those communities to see if they can learn from the, mista yeah. <laughs> the mistakes of their, of their predecessors in faith over the last 50 or 60 years. Well, I guess that's what I'm struggling with in my question. I mean, are we to be passive or are we to think you know, a little bit more creatively about what's happening there. Yeah, we've seen a pattern. Is it inevitable? It may well be that there's really nothing to do to break the pattern. But I wonder if that's really true because these patterns don't persist forever. Something changes. And one of the things that has changed is we've just, we're in a pandemic and we're seeing major changes in how people understand their role in society, what they value, how they're willing to work, where they're willing to live. There may be a moment that we're in right now that's going to signal major cultural shifts in the future. And you know, why aren't we as church thinking about, because a lot of the shifts are taking place around issues that you know, from a faith perspective, we have something to say about. You know, valuing time over money, valuing your family, and, and you know, looking at work through a more critical lens. I mean, we have a whole body of Catholic social teaching that really addresses some of these issues that we are not kind of engaging as Catholics in this country around it in a, in a moment where that could be useful in terms of thinking about how we might re revitalize our church and you know in a way that makes us more you know <laughs> shared inhabitants of a shared faith tradition as opposed to polarized enemies in a divided country. Well and there I think there are sort of things that the church is used to trying to offer but there's also just a way in which the incarnational nature of Catholicism, the idea that, you know, physical reality matters, uh, that, you know, our embodied existence matters, that we have statues and icons and all the, all the stuff of Catholic culture, like, that's also a counterpoint to the emerging and sort of accelerated by the pandemic forms of sort of totally virtualized existence, right? And I think there's something that has not yet been polarized between right and left, I think, where there's a sort of generalized sense that maybe we don't want to live in Mark Zuckerberg's multi multiverse, maybe not. <laughs> maybe we want to continue to live in reality with all you know the problems that that, that, that entails. And you know maybe the maybe the moment that a conservative leaning bishop stands up and gives a homily, you know, critiquing iPhone use, it becomes the thing that liberals attack the next day or vice versa. Like maybe maybe you can't. You know, may maybe polarization is so powerful that even issues that seem beyond left and right get sucked into it. But I, I do think right now, if a group of group that doesn't have, you know, a group of anyone, bishops, <laughs> lay people, theologians, you know, pastors, activists, and so on, put together a document or a sort of forward-looking brief on how Catholicism, you know. We're, we're selling reality, <laughs> you know. Come, come back, come back to, come back to mass, come back to reality. Um, you can put that on a billboard <laughs> over I ninety one. Anyway, I, I think there's, I think there's something there that will become only increasingly important as, you know, as the, uh, as the. Um, it's, sorry, it's, I said, did I say multiverse? When I said metaverse. <laughs> metaverse. That, yes. That's a, a Freudian, Freudian <laughs> slip of some kind, but. Anyway, we knew what you meant. Yeah, <laughs> Not the yeah I, um, I think, you know, Ross is onto something there. I, I like that, come back to reality. Uh, uh, I mean, I, you know, teared up when I came back to Mass for the first time. I mean, I, I missed it. I, I, I'm a, I was received in the church as an adult, and I, you know, became Catholic for very specific reasons, and those reasons are why I go to Mass. And so I, you would hope that something as catastrophic as the pandemic does jolt us out of our usual patterns. And I think you know, it's been depressing the extent to which that hasn't happened in certain ways. 
but we're still in the midst of this. Right. And uh, we don't know kind of what the other side's going to totally look like yet. I hope we have some, some glimmers, some sense of it. Um, but you know, I think it, it, it is, um, I mean, Ross, you said at the start of this conversation that you know, um, going from power to something else can be a, a painful transition, right? Uh, and I think you know, it's just the case that often it's genuine catastrophes of some kind, wars, famines, plagues, pandemics, that, that do... Divine chastisements, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> right, locusts, as you can get numbers. Yeah. Um, uh, did you see the scorpions in Egypt, that story? <laughs> that was really like one more thing. No, I didn't. It? I didn't. There was, it's, and I'm always a Jew. What's the, oh, uh, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess there was a very yeah. unusual weather event in Egypt of uh, a thunderstorm of <laughs> biblical proportions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Which drove the scorpions drove the out scorpions of there. Out. And hundreds of people were poisoned or stung by them because this, this happened just, just in the last two weeks. Two, yep. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, it does seem... It wasn't seem, a trending topic on Twitter, so I didn't... Yeah, it's a trending I, topic I, in Egypt. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it is these divine chastisement, punishments, catastrophes that, that do change things. And, uh, you know, I don't know where that leaves us, but I, I, I do like to, I like to point out again and again that hope is not the same as optimism. Hope is a theological virtue. And by saying we have hope for the future, it doesn't mean we think, uh, you know, It'll be easy, or or everything will be great along the way. Hope hope is not optimism. No, and something we're committed to as a Jesuit Catholic institution is accompanying young people on a journey of hope. And I think hope is something that we have to we have to continually discuss and envision and attempt to achieve. Uh, and but I don't think it's we get there through passivity. So I think we have to have some understanding of of where our struggles lie. And, and how we might might engage them and confront them. So you know, it is something, I think, to to end on before we do questions. Unless you guys have some some uh, some closing thoughts that you'd like to. Uh, I think I've been saving the the solution that would answer all these problems. I've been saving it for now. So we could yeah. <laughs> well, someone might prod us <laughs> into, into, into something new. So uh, so yes, let's invite some questions from the, from the audience. Um, We have a question right here in the front. Hi, um, thank you so much for speaking with us today. I have a question about the role, not of the Catholic Church as an institution, but of Catholic institutions within the church. So what do you think the role of like colleges such as ours, like Catholic institutions can do in easing this political divide? And are we doing it well, or what should we do, be doing better? Oh, I'm Kate, Kate, Caitlin Romain. I'm a senior. <laughs> <laughs> uh, can we jump in? Jump. Either one Why did you jump? Yes. Um, you know, I, I was thinking during the conversation, uh, I'm a on the left, uh, and when you read, you know, socialist publications, there's often this kind of thing where it's like, here's where we are, here's what we, where we want to be, and in between, you've got to organize. <laughs> and, and that box that has organizing written on it, I think there's kind of sometimes an equivalent in Catholic world where it's like, you just got to catechize everyone better, right? You just, like, you can just, if you get people to think the right way, train them the right way, but I actually think spending four years at a college like this is one way you actually can shape and form, like better, better um, Catholics, better citizens of this country, more decent and humane human beings, hopefully, um, through the kind of accompaniment and um, uh, well, educating men and women for others, right? That's, that, um, I think that's, you know, it's kind of a corny answer, uh, but I think it's true. Like this is, your four years here will deeply shape you and hopefully you come out of it, um, you know, loving Jesus more, <laughs> struggling to serve Jesus better, and uh, you know, in doing so, you know, better serve the country and the world. Hokey answer, but I, I, your question kind of made me think about you know, where the way we talk about these things, and I think this is the non, this is the real version of how you, act, you can help shape people um, in the way you're kind of describing. 
Yeah, I'll give a, I'll give a, I guess, a slightly conservative answer, <laughs> which is that I think that the, the, the temptation for Catholic colleges and all Catholic institutions, but I think it's particularly acute for, for colleges for various reasons, is to take whatever is happening in the secular world and being like, you can have the Catholic version of that, <laughs> right? Um, and there's, this is not just a problem in liberal environments and liberal campuses. I think this happens in right-wing forms too. Um, but I think it's happened, I think in general, the field of higher education is more liberal than conservative, as some, some people have pointed out. Um, the most conservative Catholic colleges are, you know, the, in the smaller ones, the more successful ones have tended to be um, more often liberal leaning. And I, I think that Catholic colleges need to offer things that only Catholicism can offer, right? They, they need to say, you know, not just that, um, you know, oh, you're excited by this cool new movement. Well, guess what? There's a saint from 47 years ago who <laughs> kind of agreed with this movement. Isn't that cool? Um, you know, you, that's, that is cool, right? And there are obviously good things in society that start and happen outside the realm of, of the church. But, but ultimately, I think for, I, I feel like, I feel like Catholic institutions have produced a lot of figures over the last 50 years who look back fondly on their Catholic education but don't feel like they actually need to practice the faith that much. Um, and then the Catholic institutions are sort of beneficently proud of those figures. So like Anthony Fauci, Catholic educated, isn't it a beautiful thing? And it's not a bad thing, but it would be better if like there was a sense of, a, a stronger sense among those kind of figures who go on to do important things in the world that Catholicism isn't just sort of something that had a nice positive influence on you once upon a time but is actually central to your identity and the work that you do in the world. And getting to that point is really challenging and I don't have like a five point blueprint for how Holy Cross can make sure that all its graduates feel that way. But, but fundamentally there has to be a confidence in Catholic schools that um, you know, the church doesn't doesn't offer the perfect answer to every political and social conundrum, but it offers something that should be central to your life as an adult going forward. Um, and you don't want to lose, yeah, f figuring out how to transmit that, I think, is the core challenge for Catholic schools right now. Like, what, what is it that Holy Cross is offering that, you know, its secular equivalent isn't offering. It can't just be a sort of Catholic gloss on exactly the same things the secular institution is offering. Here in the front. Do I take off? No, I uh, leave my mask on. Please. Yes, okay. <laughs> uh, I'm Matt Schmaltz and I teach in the Religious Studies Department here and I'd like to um, extend a bit further President Rougeau's comments about uh, global Catholicism in particular. And it seems as though Pope Francis really wants um, those of us in the Western world to listen very carefully to voices that have been relegated up until very recently to the margins of Catholic life. And so if you could, all, all three of you actually, comment upon what we can learn from those at the margins of Catholicism. what we can learn from Catholics at the margins of Catholicism. Hmm. I mean, so I'll offer, I'll, I, I will say that what I think is useful for people engaged in the kind of debates that Matt and I are often engaged in is to recognize that a lot of people at the margins of Catholic life are there for reasons that don't actually have to, a lot to do with the kind of fraught things that we bat back and forth, right? I think. Liberal, more liberal Catholics have the idea that you know people at the margins are there because you know they're sort of half in and half out of the church because 
the church is rigid or patriarchal or you know, won't change its teaching sufficiently and be merciful enough. And then conservative Catholics say, no, people have drifted to the margins because the church isn't clear about what it stands for. And you know, some version of the spiel that I gave to the previous questioner, to Caitlin, right? Um, but in fact, if you look at, like, in, and this is, again, I'm, I'm more America-centric than, than global, but I think this applies globally as well. Like, the things that push people away or send them drifting away from Catholic life are often broader social currents, like social breakdown, family. Like, like, you're more likely to have someone drift away from the church because they become an alcoholic than because they, you know, read too much of the wrong theologian and started disagreeing with the Pope, right? Like, that's just the reality of human life. Like, and in my own life, the things that have moved me back and forth, you know, from, like, sort of different degrees of practice have not, you know, have not always been theological arguments or political debates or these kinds of things. And that, this is where I do, th I think the point that Matt started with, the idea of sort of mercy and compassion and understanding is, really important, but the form it needs to take sometimes is a recognition that, you know, this person or this family have partially lost their faith or drifted to the margins for reasons that have everything to do with, you know, economic trends in their hometown or personal events in their family life. And that's, that kind of understanding is where you have to start rather than saying, you know, good news, we're bringing back the Latin mass, or good news, we've got female altar servers, you can come back now, right? Like that, I, I, I don't, I think the number of people who are directly responsive to those kinds of appeals is smaller than the number of people who have had just sort of, you know, are sort of caught up in the maelstrom of late modern life and drift away from the church for more complicated and personal reasons. And certainly I think this applies in like, you know, why isn't someone in mass in a war-torn country in sub-Saharan Africa, right? It definitely <laughs> applies, applies there. Huh. I mean, I agree with a lot of what, what Ross was driving at there, I think. And I, I was going to try to tie it back to mercy again. And I think one of the things that I, makes me most disappointed uh, sometimes when I see controversies in the church play out Sometimes I contribute to them. <laughs> uh, I, I'm not, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not. Uh, Never. Not everything I write is sober and, um, uh, you know, uncontroversial. But when I do step back and I think about some of these things, I'm, it seems like we live in a time when the message of God's grace to us should be resonating more than ever. When you look at the suffering in this world, the pandemic, which we've discussed. Right, so much loss, so much pain, families struggling in so many different ways, um, ways we don't even know about sometimes. It's, it's shocking how people suffer and you don't know it, right? And then you find out and you think, wow, how was that person, I was really not nice to them. I almost used a different word. <laughs> I, I was not nice to them, uh, but they, and, and, I, and you realize they were suffering that whole time and they didn't reply, respond in kind. You, 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 we know this, and yet um, it seems like, as Ross said, that some of the arguments that we have are totally disconnected from the way God's love meets us in those places of need. And I think one of the things I do love about Francis, whatever, however else we might you know, criticize him or have differences of opinion of him, I do think that entering into the suffering of others is something that he has very beautifully written and spoken about again and again. And um, so to, to, to your question, I mean, to, to me, you know, this is to constantly be reminded of what is actually at the center of our faith and, you know, what the, what the main thing is. Um, that is, you know, how I would be, try to at least begin answering your question. Yeah, I mean, I took your question to me. It made me think more about in, uh, the marginalized. I mean, people who are living in conditions that should remind us of the fragility of our position and our station and reconnect us to the core gospel values that we seem so very far from often when we're having these other discussions uh, about what's going on in the church today. So I mean, you know, the experience of a migrant, for instance, who has, for reasons that would drive any of us to the, you know, the brink of you know, giving up on life, 
have made the last final decision to just take a chance on crossing the border, and you know, regardless of its legality. I mean, I think of the Syrians, for instance. Um, you know, would you have stayed? Um, and what do those people have to teach us about our human condition? And how does that connect with the values of our faith and remind us of our, you know, our connections to all of, our, of the other human beings in the world? Because this could be any one of us. And that in engaging those who are suffering, we are reminded of Christ's suffering, but we're also reminded that suffering could reach any of us. And that humanizing that individual, humanizing those communities, bringing them forward, engaging them, not simply in acts of charity, but in meaningful conversations about what they're enduring and why, reminding ourselves, for instance, that we are not always in control of the consequences of our lives' directions. And I think as Americans in particular, we fall easily into the trap of thinking that if we just work hard enough, if we just follow the rules, if we just do everything right, everything will be okay. But a lot of people in Syria did that, and they weren't okay. A lot of people in Central America do that, and they're not okay. So, I mean, what, there, we don't, we aren't in control. You know, there are things beyond our ability to control that we need to understand and we, our faith helps us do that, but I think often we're not, in, we're not thinking about this. So I think by being in those conversations, by bringing those communities forward, we would be better Christians, actually. Yes, on the, on the aisle. Hi, I'm Emily, I'm a junior. Um, as you probably know, Joe Biden is only the second Catholic president in US history. How do you think our public policy would look different and the relationship that many American Catholics have with the church would look different if we had more Catholic presidents? <laughs> it really depends which ones, right? <laughs> there was the, this, the great line when, when the, uh, you know, John F. Kennedy was running for president and all these, you know, there was a group of Protestant ministers who, you know, rather famously were worried and didn't, didn't want him to be elected. And Jackie Kennedy, his wife, said something like, you know, if only they knew what a terrible Catholic he is. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a para, that's a paraphrase. Um, I, I think that, Amer so I, I think that is a place actually where a a statesman-like Catholic politician could actually have a really positive effect on the issues that we're batting back and forth here and failing to resolve, right? That to, obviously to some extent, the problem of polarization has to be resolved from the bottom up, but presidents do have a unique power to set the tone for things. And I think that if you had, um, if you had a Republican Catholic president who as president made a series of public choices and interventions that clearly manifested ways in which he was a Catholic before he was a Republican. Um, I think you can probably come up with a list of ways that that could happen. It would be good for the church's public witness and people's understanding of what Catholicism means. Um, and, you know, I think it would be really good if Joe Biden was pro-life. Um, I, you know, am obviously enough of a political realist to see that he's not going to wake up tomorrow and say, actually, I really hope Amy Coney Barrett writes the ruling striking down <laughs> Roe v. Wade. I do think Joe Biden could wake up tomorrow and go out and say, you know, I think that like, you know, the, the views that I had on abortion in the late 1980s and early 1990s when I was more of a safe, legal, and rare Democrat um, than a get rid of the Hyde Amendment Democrat were correct. And I've been pressured by activists in my party to become more overwhelmingly pro-choice and today I'm going to start resisting that pressure because I'm the president I can do what I want and I'm going to propose like five compromises on abortion that you know a bunch of pro-life activists would probably reject but would like manifest his movement away from his own party's extreme on that issue I think that would be really good and you know it's not going to happen but he could do it he has you know he's and and a future president, Marco Rubio, or whichever other Republican you wanted to choose, <laughs> could make those kind of choices too. Um, so I think, the, I think the president, almost alone among politicians, has, would have a kind of unique power to reframe how we think about Catholics in politics. Um, 
and if you know, if yeah, so, so, someday, someday, I'm sure that that will happen, and all my dreams will come true. <laughs> Got well, dreams. For better or worse, right? That power. Um, well, yeah. You know, it's uh, um, and I, but I, just to extend Ross's point, I do like that it was a non-pessimistic answer. That human beings have agency, and they our do. leaders can do things. And I, I, since we've been kind of pessimistic in certain ways, I did want to underscore that. And um, I was in preparation for this. I was rereading, being the, the Francis Simp I am, reading uh, Fratelli Tutti. And it is remarkable how much he is. The much Pope. It's, he not, is, it's okay yeah. to be. Um, a how often he talks of dreaming in that uh, encyclical, and it, it is like an antidote to, or, or almost trying to cajole us, will us out of a certain pessimism that we can't change anything, that the systems we live in and under are unalterable, and that kind of urging us to dream again. I do think you know. I like Ross's answer because, yeah, we can elect someone and that person can, can behave in a way that actually might matter. That's, those are well, small. There, and there, and there are these moments, mm -hmm. right? Like, like with the January 6th stuff, right? Like January 6th created a moment when a group of Republican politicians had an opportunity to impeach and remove Donald Trump in a way that, that doesn't exist in every moment every day, right? right? Like mm -hmm. the average Republican senator right now has a very limited number of things he can do about the problem of Trumpification and radicalization in the party. And he or you and I would probably disagree on the range of those things. But like, I, I think you, as a politician, in the day to day to do your job, you do have to be constrained by reality, right? But then moments come when there are, there's sort of the range of possibilities widens. And those moments close up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. But they are there and, you know, they come along in different ways every six months, every two years, every 10 years. But when they're there, you want, you want to actually seize them. Like there, it feels to me like in, I think about this a lot with Trump and the Republicans where I think there have been like four or five moments when specific Republicans had opportunities to redirect the trajectory the party has taken. Those, are, those moments come and go, um, they aren't always there you have to be looking for them as a, as a public figure if you're trying to be more than just a prisoner of your times and your circumstances. Yeah, I've, I've been interested one way Biden, it, during the campaign I thought Biden's Catholicism mattered in the context of the pandemic in a certain way, the kind of the griever in chief. And you can, whether you like that or not, I, I, I do think there was something to it that the man's personal history uh, the, the death of his uh, wife and daughter, and then son. Um, you know, that part of his biography, it's so bound up with his faith. Um, you know, it was Father O'Donovan, the, the former president of Georgetown, who, who prayed at Biden's inauguration, who also said, Bo Biden's funeral mass. Yeah. And I thought there was something about what Biden was doing. Maybe he was a little too old, a little too, you know, not energetic, something to, to kind of grasp that and do more of it. He did a fair amount. But I thought like the that was the inaugural. Strong, the inaugural right? was super Catholic. Yeah, it was. It was. Yeah, it, it was it I was, liked it, and I. Yeah, I think fundamentally he's uh -huh. just. I mean, it's it's a it's a general commentary on what awaits us all. But I think he's probably fundamentally too old to be a more dynamic figure in terms of establishing what Biden era political Catholicism means. Yeah. Um, in a way that I might agree. not have been the case 20 years ago. But I thought the pandemic was an interesting case of that, where I, you could see the, the beginnings or the seeds of something there that could have been interesting and turned out not to be as much as it might have been, but for the reasons you're getting at. Well, I believe we're out of time, and I want to end on this moment of, of, of agreement and coalescence. <laughs> I know there's much but more to We agree that Joe Biden's <laughs> old. That Joe Biden's too old. It's the consensus of 2024. A fact in evidence that all it sucks. <laughs> uh, but I want to thank both of our guests for this lively and stimulating conversation. Thank you all for joining Thank us, and guys. I hope you have a very good night. It was a pleasure. Great Thank to be you. with you. Likewise. Many, many lessons. I think it was the law school experience. Of me.